let me first review what we did yesterday. So what we did yesterday is, uh, what I explained yesterday in the beginning, is to explain the relation between the existence of infinitely many conserved charges and the Ambachter equation in two dimensions. So what I argued is that if you have infinitely many higher spin conserved charges, uh, and if your theory is living on one plus one dimension, then you can show the factorization of the S matrix and also the Young Baxter equation. And then I proceeded to explain uh, how to determine the 2 to 2 S matrix of O and sigma model in one plus one dimension. And the inputs well, were basically three axioms. Uh, the first one is the Young Baxter equation. So I basically claim that ON model has infinitely many conserved charges, and then uh, use the Ambaxter equation to constrain the S matrix. And in addition, I impose a cross symmetry, uh, which is of this form. I think now I got the indices correct. And I didn't quite explain why uh, C, the left-hand side and right-hand side are related by theta going to i pi minus theta, but it's just, it's just uh, it's just a kind of a rewriting of S going to T, which is the same end of uh, crossing equation. So if you uh, write down the expression for the Mandelstam variable in terms of the rapidity theta, then S and T are given by these equations. And then you can easily see that theta going to I pi minus theta exchanges S and T. And the third equation that I used was the unitarity, uh, which is basically a statement that S theta times S minus theta is, uh, is the unit matrix. And by using that, I could constrain the 2 to 2 S matrix. So that was what we did yesterday. But uh, there is one thing I didn't quite explain yesterday, which is why and how O and sigma model have highest spin conserved charges. So that's the first topic today. So the lecture two. So this is a continuation of the previous lecture. So the classical versus quantum integrability in ON model. So what I'm going to talk about today is essentially just a review of the paper by Goldschmidt and Witten. But uh, I'm going to explain from a slightly modern viewpoint, uh, which came out from the ongoing study with uh, Raghu Mahajan and Shuhen Shao, both of which are in Princeton. OK, so let me first show argue that there exists classically infinitely many conserved charges or conserved currents. Let's start with the classical analysis. And in order to do that, uh, we need to know the uh, equation of motion of ON nonlinear sigma model. So let me first derive that. So the uh, action of the ON nonlinear sigma model, which I wrote yesterday, is given by this. So you have coupling constant in front, and then you have and this O and vector field, and then there is a Lagrange multiplier which sets the magnitude of the vector field vector to be one. But for the purpose of discussion today, uh, I'm going to replace. I'm going to go to the Lorentzian signature. So I'm going to use plus minus notation rather than del del bar. Well, there is actually no uh, deep reason for that, but I just wanted to do that. And in addition, I'm going to rescale the field N so that now you have, uh, ac now the action becomes this. So now there is no one over K in front, but one over K appears like this. OK? This is just a rescaling of the vector field N. Now. So if now my task is to derive the equation of motion starting from this action. And if you take the variation with respect to n, what you get is something like this. Minus sigma uh, n vector is 0. 
But of course, that's not the end of the story. Uh, we also need to get rid of sigma. Uh, we, want, we want to eliminate. And, but there is a very simple way to eliminate this sigma. So the idea is to uh, take the right hand, left hand side and consider the dot product, inner product, with the vector n. And if you do so, what you get is n dotted del plus del minus n vector minus sigma n vector dotted n vector equals zero. And we know because of the constraint, this is nothing but one of a kappa. And furthermore, okay, let me go to the next page. Furthermore, you had this factor, but this can be uh, rewritten as minus del plus vector n dot del minus vector n dot. And the reason for this is because we have the constraint that, uh, sorry, we have the constraint that um, n dot n is constant. So if you take uh, the derivative of this guy, then it becomes zero. And if you rewrite it, then this, it becomes this equation. Now, using this equation to this uh, Lagrangian, you can uh, rewrite uh, the original, you can determine the value of sigma and then get the following equation of motion of the ON nonlinear sigma model. So this is the answer. Sorry. Yes, so we, uh, it's just a multiplication. Yes, thank you. And by the way, this, uh, this notation is of course, well, I guess you, you can guess, but this basically means this. All right, so this is the equation of motion. And now, uh, using this equation of motion, using this, you can easily show that uh, this equation for any integer k, well, of course, it must be positive, where, sorry, this is minus, minus, minus. OK, so, and where this t plus plus is this one. For example, for k equals 1, it's very simple, because now uh, the inside the bracket, you only have n plus, n plus. And if you take the derivative with respect, 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 respect to the minus direction, then essentially for k equals 1, this reduces to showing that this is 0. But you can actually show it using the equation of motion. Uh, the reason is because n plus minus can be rewritten as, sorry, this is just a bit confusing, but this is not, well, yeah, okay. This is just the usual multiplication. And if you're use, using equation motion, you can rewrite this as n plus dotted n. So this is proportional to this dot, dotted product. But this is 0, because uh, this is nothing but derivative of some constant thing. Yeah, maybe I should put one, one half here. OK. So in this way, class, OK, so I only showed it for k equals 1, but I think you can easily see that it, the proof can be extended for a, a larger case. And in this way, you can actually show, classically, there exists many higher spin conserved currents, uh, which is given by this equation. So now, the question I want to ask is whether these conservation law uh, survive uh, at the quantum level. So at the quantum level, well, if you start, yeah, as you heard from Kazuya, uh, in some cases, the classical conservation law, laws are violated because of the quantum correction. And what in, this basically means in this context that uh, in, at the quantum level, you can have some operator O Sorry, this looks like zero, right? So 
let's see. So you have some operator A, uh, which violates the, which can violate the conservation law. So if this A exists, then you you would say the conservation law is violated. But we should be a little bit more careful about that because if this A is, for example, by itself given by some derivative or a del minus or del plus, then in that case, uh, the conservation law is not violated. So what I mean by that is that if A is zero and every, on, the only thing you can have on the right-hand side is just the derivatives, then you can just like a, redefine the conserved currents and then you can still have the current conservation law. So now, uh, from this analysis, uh, now the task becomes clear. So the task is to list all operators uh, with spin 2k minus 1, uh, delta 2k plus 1, uh, which are not derivatives. So the reason I said the spin to 2k minus 1 is because this guy has spin 2k plus 2k, and this guy has spin minus 1. So the total spin is 2k minus 1. On the other hand, if you just naively count the dimension of, on the left-hand side, it's 2k plus 1. OK, so essentially, all operators with spin 2k minus 1 and delta 2k plus 1 basically list all possible operators here. And then we need to further require that they are not derivatives. But since you already heard both the lecture by both, then you can see that some, I think you encountered something similar. So the operators, uh, which are not derivatives, are in conformal field theory, essentially the conformal primary operators. Uh, but I, sh I don't say that this is equal to conformal primaries because we know that the ON sigma model is not conformal primaries. But there is, in some sense, uh, we can use the notion or like a t notion of conformal symmetry, but I will explain that later. But anyway, the task is this. But in order to carry out this task, we need to be careful so that we don't overcount the operators. So there are some constraints that we need to impose when we count the operators. The constraint one is that operator, operator must be ON invariant. So there is underlying symmetry. Oh. Oh, now no, it's OK. <laughs> All right, so, so the operator must be ON invariant. And the reason is because T plus plus to K is essentially given by the ON invariant combination. So, and we know that the, sim the theory has ON symmetry, so the right-hand side should also be ON invariant, which basically means that you can write something like, is, this is OK, but for example, you cannot just write N. This is, this is bad. This is not allowed. So the second constraint is, of course, the constraint of the ON model, which, is, which basically states that n dot n is 1. Uh, and this, there is a kind of easy way to take into account this constraint. So to do that, the idea is to, again, consider some derivative, k1, k2, and of this n dot n. And this has to be 0 because it's a derivative of 1. And if you expand out these derivatives, then the, leading, the first time you get is n dot del plus k1, del minus k2, n. And then you got a bunch of other things, something like this. For example, uh, k1 minus 1, del minus k2, n. And the claim is that because the sum of these guys are zero, you can always eliminate 
uh, eliminate, well, it's hard to see, Nate. Eliminate this first term in favor of the rest of the terms, which basically means that you can effectively constrain, uh, you can effectively impose this constraint, which is all ends must come with derivatives. Is this point clear? Okay, so this is the second constraint. And now there is a third constraint. But let me just wait a little bit. So O n must come with derivatives. Now there is a third constraint, which is equation of motion, which I derived earlier. Let me just write it again. Kappa and plus dot and minus dot and equals zero. This equation is of course nonlinear because well, and that's basically why nonlinear sigma well, why it's called nonlinear sigma model. But and you can see that here you see the coupling constant. But I claim that for the purpose of counting the operator we can completely ignore this nonlinear term. We can ignore. Of course, this manipulation is exactly cor correct if uh, kappa equals zero. And if kappa is non-zero, uh, well, this equation is not correct, and then you get some additional term. But uh, basically, the idea is that, well, the idea is to first to use the equation of motion for kappa equals z zero, and then you do the analysis. And if you do the analysis, then you get some set of conserved currents, some of which are not conserved if you use the nonlinear equation of motion. But you can also think of it as some kind of anomaly. So previously, I was talking about the anomaly, which comes from the genuine quantum correction, like, like loop correction. But you can also say, include this nonlinear term of the equation motion into the quantum anomaly. Anomaly. So is this point clear? So the idea is just use kappa equals zero equation motion and then uh, do the analysis that I described before, like uh, the, which is basically counting all possible operators which are not derivatives. So let me just write it down. So for the purpose, for, for counting operators, we can set kappa equals zero. So kappa equal non-zero effect can be absorbed into anomaly. Okay, so effectively, then what we need to do is very simple because we can set n plus minus to be zero, which basically means that uh, the vector n cannot have mixed index. It can only have pl all plus indices or it can only have all minus indices. Now, let's count the possible anomaly term, which appears in this simplest highest spin current. So the first task is to count all possible operators without worrying about whether they are derivatives or not. The simplest uh, ON nonlinear combination is made up of uh, this kind of product. And of course, uh, on the left hand side, I have four plus uh, indices and one minus index, and we need to sp sprinkle those indices to these ends. But actually, for this, uh, like a bilinear, op bilinear operator, there is only one choice because I al already claimed that uh, ends cannot have mixed index. So the only way is to put mi minus index to the left and uh, all the plus index indices to the right. 
Now, in addition to this guy, there is also an operator made up of uh, four ends. Again, it's not so hard to uh, write down all possible combinations. So one, this is one combination. And there is yet another combination, which is this one. OK. And actually, this is everything we need to do. Because in, uh, you might think that we can also write down the operator, which contains six ends. But the problem is that we only have five indices, one minus and four pluses. So if you have five ends, then one of the ends must, must come without index. But I already claim that all ends must here, all ends must come with derivatives. So this is all the operators that you can write down. So now, the next task is to eliminate derivatives from it. So to do that, I just list all possible derivatives which can appear on the right-hand side of the conservation law. So there are two kinds of derivative. One is a derivative of minus direction. And this one is very easy to list. So one is this, and the other is uh, this. So this is the, all, the operator which contains two ends and one, one their minus. And in addition to this, I also have this guy. And then uh, I also have del plus, which is like this. And del plus. Okay, so these are all possible operators, derivatives that you can write. Well, I think it's not so hard to check it later if you have time. So now I have three possible operators and I have five derivatives. So actually derivatives has, is the number of deriv derivatives is larger than the number of operators, but, which seems good, but it's a bit strange <laughs> because here, I have listed all possible operators. And down here, I put a constraint that the operator is derivative and listed all possible operators. And I got the larger number. And the resolution is actually simple. Well, first of all, um, let's see. The, first of all, uh, this guy is actually classically 0 because it's nothing but the t plus plus square. So it's a kind of silly to have the same term on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. So when counting the operator, uh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think you didn't know which operator I was talking about. <laughs> so, so I was talking about this operator. <laughs> yes, this operator. This operator is nothing but t plus plus squared. And it's a kind of silly to list the same operator on both sides. And also, it's classically 0, so I shouldn't consider this operator. And secondly, uh, one co linear combination of these two guys is actually del minus, sorry, del, del minus del plus square t plus plus, which is again 0 because derivatives commute, and we know that the stress energy tensor is conserved. So we, also, we can also eliminate this guy, for example, when counting the operator. Now we, now this, this is complete classification. And we have three possible operators and three possible derivatives, which mean that all possible operators can be expressed as a linear combination of derivatives. This basically says that uh, this current conservation law is also valid also quantum mechanically. Of course, uh, quantum mechanically, the form of the current might be a little bit modified because there can be derivative term and you, can, you need to like, redefine the current. 
But what's important is that there is a spin four conserved current. Okay. And you can actually also do spin the same analysis for spin six. Uh, it's a bit complicated, but you can do. And of course, it's a bit hard to show this for all possible spins. But there is a nice uh, result by Park in 1980, which states that uh, two highest spin conserved current is actually enough to guarantee a Baxter equation. To show this, he also, in addition to the simplistic argument that I gave last, uh, yesterday, he also used some causality. So if you use some extra input, you, actually it is enough to have two higher spin conserved currents. And we just show that actually, well, we didn't show for spin six, but we just argue that spin four, there exists spin four and spin six conserved currents for ON models, which basically guarantees the Jan Baxter equation. So that, that's why I could use the Jan Baxter equation to determine the 2 to 2 s matrix yesterday. Okay. Sure. Current? Spin eight or higher conserved current. Okay, so uh, if you do this analysis, then uh, the answer is not conclusive. You can, you, you, you can actually see the possible anomaly. So you, you, you can argue that there can be possible anomaly. But, uh, but then you can ask whether this anomaly is, all, 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 is actually there in the actual model, for example, in the computation. Uh, at this moment, I actually don't know any computation which explicitly did that. Then uh, we have, then if there's no higher spin conserved mm -hmm. current higher than eight, mm -hmm. then there's only finite conserved current. Mm -hmm. and it, can we call uh, when model is still integrable? Uh, okay, so if you have two higher spin conserved currents, you can show the factorization of the three to three um, uh, S matrix, and then you can impose the Baxter. And using the S matrix that you get, got from this analysis, like uh, imposing the Baxter, then you can also construct a higher, uh, like a higher uh, multi-particle amplitude as well. And that seems to obey all possible, like all, all, all the axioms of the S matrix. So it's at least consistent, but I'm not sure like, if this is a logical derivation. Okay, thank you. Yes. Is this result to be valid in the form of point dimension? Yes. Can, they, can, can they extend this to higher uh, Okay, so the relation between the uh, higher conserved charges and the Baxter equation exists in 1 plus 1 D. And the reason is because if you are in the higher dimensions, uh, you can still assume that the existence of higher spin conserved currents and then do the analysis of like a wave, wave packet and like a shift in the trajectories. But the problem is that in higher D, there are more freedom to shift the wave packet. Then in typically, uh, even, the, even if the initial condition, you have some scattering, if you shift the wave packet, then the particles do not interact because they can, they can be shifted. So which means that in higher dimension, if you have higher spin conserved current, then uh, the theory must be free. That's the statement of coleman mandula theory. Okay, so, so, so I explained so, um, the case about uh, ON model, but uh, more generally, this analysis can be extended, and, uh, and there is, you can say that if, okay, so if, this number is positive. So let me first write the formula and explain what the numbers are. If this is, then it exists spin 2k current. And this n is essentially the number of, number of primary operators with delta and dimension delta and spin s. Okay. So maybe I should make a comment about conformal symmetry, but 
uh, because I promised to make a little bit of comment. So, as I said, uh, ON model is generally non conformal. Uh, it has a non trivial R RG flow. But if you go back to what I did in the analysis, uh, when, when imposing the equation motion constraint, I was basically like uh, neglecting the nonlinear term. And after doing that, the theory essentially became free. And the free theory has a conformal symmetry. So there is some well-defined notion of conformal primary in that limit. And then you can do the counting here, there. OK, so that was the basic idea of how to prove the quantum integrability of the sigma model. And, and now I'm going to move on to the next topic. But before doing that, is there any more questions? Yes. No, 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 global. OK. All right, so now let's move on to the second topic, which is the relation between four dimensional theory and one plus one dimensional theory and integrability. So, so far, I've been talking about uh, the integrability which exists in one plus one dimensions. Uh, but, uh, but actually, you can apply some of those techniques to study uh, three plus one dimensional gauge theory, which is, very, uh, which is of interest to many of us. And uh, the theory that I'm going to talk about is n equals four super young male theory. And what I'm going to explain is how the one plus one dimensional system emerges from three plus one dimensional system. So that's what, I, what I'm going to do in the rest of the lecture today. So let me list some of the properties of the n equals four super m mil theory in one, three plus one dimension. Um, so firstly, this is a maximally supersymmetric gauge theory in three, in 4D. So I, I think you remember that uh, in Thomas's lecture, uh, he argued that uh, the, uh, the maximal possible amount of su supersymmetries that, that the field theory ha can have is 16. So, and actually this is the theory which has 16 su supersymmetry. And and in addition to this supersymmetry, or accompanied by this supersymmetry, is the R symmetry, uh, and which is SO6 for this theory. So essentially, what I'm saying is that an n equal four super mil theory has SO6 global symmetry, in addition to supersymmetries. And furthermore, what's most interesting for any about n equals four super mu theory is act, this is actually conformal field theory in three plus one dimension. And because, because of that, it has SO4 comma two uh, symmetry. And as you know, this SO6 is essentially equivalent to SU4. And this SO4 comma two is also, like if you ignore this uh, signature, it, it's the same as SU4, but I would prefer to write it as SU2 comma two. Uh, by taking into account the signature. And combining all these symmetries, you have uh, what this n equals four super conformal symmetry. Uh, which is called PSU two two slash four. Yeah. Uh, well, although I listed all these properties, that, but I'm actually not going to use the detail for like uh, properties of this, these symmetry groups. So you, if you don't know much about this, what this P means and what this slash means, uh, you don't need to worry about it. Okay, so, so this is a basic property of n equals for super mu theory. And let me also uh, explain the field content 
of this theory. And again, I don't need to use uh, the full, I don't need to know the full field contents, but let me just uh, list some of them. So n equals four super mu theory have six scalars, uh, which transform as a vector of SO6 symmetry. So this I runs from one to six. And in addition to that, of course, because it's a gauge theory, it has gauge field, a mu. And in addition to that, you have like a five fermions, sorry, eight fermions, <laughs> psi and psi bar, but I'm not going to talk about that uh, in this lecture because I'm not going to use it. So let's just put it in the parenthesis. Um, but what's, more, what's important is that all these fields are in the same multiplet of the superconformal group. And because of that, uh, which means that a mu and phi i are related by some action of the uh, supersymmetry or superconformal symmetry. And because of this, uh, all these fields are, belong to the adjoint representation of the gauge group SUN. Uh, which basically means you can regard these fields as some matrices. And A and B runs from one to N. And the gauge transformation acts like phi I going to G phi I G inverse. Okay. So, so that was a kind of brief review and a brief summary of what the N equals four super mu theory is. Uh, now, let me describe how it is related to the spin chain. Okay. All right, so now to, to discuss the relation with the spin chain, I'm, now I need to talk about some local operator called the single trace operators. As you heard in Bolt's lecture, uh, in conformal field theory, the basic observables are co correlation functions of local operators. And in this n equals four super mu theory, there is a nice class of local operator called the single trace operator, uh, which, is which is of the following form. So the idea is to take various fields, for example, the scalar fields, and, and multiply them. And well, as I said, each field belongs to the adjoint representation. So you can think of them as n times n matrices, so you can just multiply them, and then take a product and, and, put, and take the trace, and if you take the trace, it becomes gauge invariant, and evaluate it at one particular space-time point. So this is a kind of convenient way of constructing the gauge invariant operators. And if you think of this operator at tree level, uh, there is no problem. For example, if you insert this operator O in some correlation function, at tree level, what you need to do is to just do the bunch of weak contractions, which is, of course, OK. But uh, at one loop, there is some problem, precisely because you are putting various fields at the same position. So, so if you compute some, if you try to compute some correlation function, then uh, there is some UV divergence. And the reason why it's UV divergent is because uh, different fields are at the same position. And typically, if you have something like that, then if you start loop doing the loop computation, you see some divergence. Now, of course, this is a well-known uh, well-known phenomenon in quantum field theory, and we, of course, need know how to resolve this problem. So essentially, the resolution is to renormalize the operator.
So that's what we need to do. And so let me, uh, let me explain how this renormalization works in practice without going too much in detail about the computation. So let's consider some, uh, okay, so let me first think, let me first point out, uh, because we need to renormalize the operator, this like a naive, ex this naive expression of this, of this operator is not actually correct. And probably we should call it as a bare operator. So these, I put the index B to denote that they are bare operators. So let's take two bare operators, sorry, uh, this must be Y, and compute the two-point function. As I said, at tree level, there is no problem. So if you do the computation, uh, you get something like X minus Y, and then, so you have, you have the bunch of weak, con weak contraction, and after the weak contraction, you get something like this, delta ij. So suppose, well, this i and j are some abstract uh, index lab labeling for the operator, uh, and we assume that at tree level we uh, choose it so that the two-point function becomes diagonal. So this is the result for tree level. I'm just saying that the tree level result is just by weak contraction. But, uh, but of course, as I said, there is some problem at one loop and in particular, we basically know what kind of divergence will appear at one loop because, uh, and it goes, well, because it's a gauge theory and it's classically, well, it's conformal. So the only divergence which can appear in this computation is logarithmic divergence. So this, ba this is basically saying that, so this is a coupling constant. So you get some free factor, which I denote by this. And then you have logarithmic divergence. So you need to introduce some cutoff. But of course, inside the log logarithm, uh, you must have dimensionless number. So the, and the only dimensionful combination that you have in this analysis is this x minus y. So that's, why, that's what, we, what you expect. OK, at one loop. OK? And and this gamma ij, in, gen in general, are, is not diagonal. So it can define some non-trivial matrix for the indices i and j. And the idea is to diagonal first diagonalize this gamma ij and define new basis of operators. Let's call it O tilde i and O tilde j. And after doing so, you are, the leading term is unchanged, but now you have delta, okay, you have delta ij now in front, and you have one minus two times g squared gamma i log lambda x minus y. Okay? This is much nicer than the previous one because now things are diagonal, but still you see the explicit dependence on the uh, UV cutoff that we introduced by hand. And of course, in order to kill that UV de uh, dependence, we need to define renormalized operator, which is essentially given by this expression. So this is the usual renormalization. And after doing that, if you compute a two-point function, now you're in business. Two delta i, zero times one minus two g squared comma i log x minus y. Oh, by the way, maybe I should have emphasized that this small gamma is essentially the eigenvalue of large gamma. So essentially what we did is to diagonalize the matrix. Okay, so now, so this is the expression for the renormalized operator, and then now if you stare, it, stare at it, then you immediately realize that this is nothing but the expansion of this. Okay, sorry, I should put g squared here. 
So this is basically saying that this gamma i, which is the eigenvalue of uh, gamma ij, large gamma ij, basically corrects the dimension of the operator. So this is how the dimensions gets corrected uh, if you do the perturbation theory, like if you do the perturbation theory or for some conformal field theory. OK, is this point clear? So now this is a corrected dimension. So this is basically telling us, so let me just summarize what I explained. So summary, so what, what to compute two point function at the quantum level in this n equals four super mu theory, we first need to compute log divergence so using direct uh, uh, Feynman diagram computation, and then diagonalize gamma ij and read off the eigenvalue. And the eigenvalue will give you the corrected anomalous dimension, sorry, corrected uh, conformal dimension. OK. So far, so good. So, so now, Having said that, now let's proceed to the real computation and carry out these processes. But of course, carrying out these computation is a bit boring because I need to do some loop computation. So I will try to avoid the computation as much as possible by imposing some like uh, consistency condition or some other information that we know. So now the section three is the computation. And the title contains large n because I will perform the computation at large n. Now, in principle, there are many different single trace operators because we have many different fields in n equals four super emissary, including fermions and so on. But let's consider the operator O i, which is just made of scalars. So essentially, that's what we have been talking about already. And let me just remind you that this i's runs from 1 to 6. And as I said uh, in the previous slide, uh, that what we need, OK, so as, as, as I said here, uh, what we first need to do is to compute the log divergence uh, of this two point, of this, t take this operator and compute the two-point function and read off the log divergence. So that's what we need to do. Yes. Yes. Uh, at one. Uh, yes, at one loop. Yes. Sorry. Uh, because um, yeah, in order to have fermions, I think you need to go to higher loops. But okay. but in higher loop, you do uh, these operators do mix with other operators. So okay, thank it's you. just a, like a one loop thing. OK, so now what I'm going to do is to compute a two-point function in, in the large n limit and read off the log divergence. OK, now to do the, before doing that, let me make some several observations. So observation one. So observation one is a property coming from the large n limit. So actually, I didn't quite explain what the large n limit is. So the large n limit is essentially the limit where n goes to infinity, while lambda, which is defined by g m mil square times n, held fixed. So this is, we already considered a similar limit in the case of O-n model, and this is the uh, analogous limit for the case of n equals four super m mil theory. And in this limit, uh, well, by the way, uh, how many people are familiar with large n expansion, like a two foot expansion? Uh, who are not familiar with large n expansion? <laughs> okay, but let me just very briefly review what large n expansion is. So in this large n limit, there is a nice way to write down the diagram, which is to use the double line notation. So each 
compute comes with two indices, so you have two, like in order to write the one propagator, you, it's better to like, uh, represent the propagator uh, by two lines. And then if you use this, then you can classify a diagram using, based on the topology of the diagram. For example, at two loop you can have this diagram or this diagram. Okay, and, and each index loop gives you n. So here you have n, 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 and because, it's, because you have like one, two, three, four vertices, you have gm is four times n, four, whereas here you have uh, the same gm is coupling, but you have, okay, so this is not planar diagram actually. So you have one face which is n and other phase, which is n, so you have gm is squared times n. So this is essentially suppressed in the large n limit. Essentially, the rule is you cannot basically cross these double lines because it leads to non-planar diagram. That's basic, basic rule. Now, using this large n expansion, let's try to compute the two-point function of some trace operator. Let's, of this form, for example. If I write down the index, it's going to be A, B, B, C, C, A, right? And in the large N, so operator O1. So in this double line notation, this operator is represented by this uh, expression. So this line, this part of the line uh, is A index, and this part of the line is B index, and this part of the line is C index. And this basically is phi, and this is another phi, and this is another phi. Okay. And using this notation, you can, for example, compute the tree level two point function of this kind of operator, and it's essentially just given by this because it's planar. So this is tree level. Next, if you go to the one loop, then uh, you can, for example, add some uh, at one loop. You can add some glue on propagator, for example, like this. But the important point is that you, although you can uh, connect this propagator and this propagator using glue on, di glue on propagator, but you cannot connect this and this using the glue on diagram. This is not allowed, uh, essentially because in order to connect these two propagators, uh, you need to have non-planar weak contractions. So this is basically saying that there is some notion of nearest neighbor interaction. If you consider large n limit. So this is the observation one. Sorry? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> yes, that's a good point. <laughs> in this particular case, actually, you can connect this and this because you can go, you can draw a diagram like this. So that was, yeah, that's what Seok was <laughs> pointing at it out. But okay, if you have like four legs, then uh, if you have, like, let's say you have four legs, then you cannot connect this guy and this guy because now it becomes non-planar. It was actually a good point. Thank you for pointing it out. <laughs> okay, so now let me make second observation, which is about SO6 flavor structure or SO6 index structure. So in the previous slide, I said at one loop you, need, you can uh, connect two propagators using gluon exchange. But there are actually more interaction vertices that you can draw, that you can use to construct the one-loop diagram. And for, let me just list all of them. So one diagram is this uh, scalar quartic. So n equals four, Yamil series has a scalar quartic vertex, so you can use it to construct the loop diagram. Uh, by the way, now I'm not using the double line notation for simplicity. And of course, you have gluon exchange, something like, which I denote by this, gluon exchange. 
And in addition, you may have some self-energy diagram, which basically corrects the propagator. But there is a one important difference between the first scalar quartic diagram and the uh, second and third diagrams, uh, which is essentially SO, which is basically the SO6 index structure. So as I said, uh, I'm now focusing on the operator, which are made up of just scalars, and each scalar comes with index. So when you draw this diagram inside a two-point function, then these lines are basically scalars, and it comes with index like this. Uh, which runs from one to six. And for, this two, for these two diagrams, it turns out if you just disc discuss the uh, SO6 index structure, it's essentially just given by this. I think that is kind of clear for this self-energy diagram because, well, first of all, L and J are directly contracted and, and that because of some SO6 uh, symmetry uh, conservation, uh, this I and K must be the same. And that is also the case for gluon exchange because basically gluon doesn't carry any SO6 charge. But on the other hand, the scalar quartic vertex can actually uh, give you some non-trivial tensor structure of SO6. Let me see what kind of structure it can give by explicitly writing down the interaction vertex. So in n equals 4 CPMU theory, the interaction vertex, the scalar quartic interaction vertex comes from this term, so this, which is the uh, uh, square of the commutator. And if you expand the commutator, then it basically gives you two different terms. One is phi i, phi j, phi i, phi j, and the other is minus, because of the uh, commutator, phi i, phi i, phi j, and phi j, okay? And so essentially, if you take into account cyclic ordering, it's like a, this one is i j, i j, and this one is i, i, j, j. And what you need to do is to use this vertex uh, here, insert this vertex here, and see what kind of tensor structure it gives. And, and for this guy, it's kind of clear uh, what kind of tensor structure you will get. So, so essentially, I claim that this guy gives two different tensor structure, which is one of them is this, and the other is this. So I'm using the same notation that I used in the previous lecture. So I, J, K, L. Okay, now I think I flipped K and L, but let me not worry about it. Okay, so this, uh, if you use this vertex, you get these two uh, tensor structure. On the other hand, this vertex basically gives you this tensor structure if you insert it in this diagram. Okay, so I actually flipped K and L, but let me not worry about it. Okay. And in particular, uh, it comes with a factor of two as compared to these guys, because uh, the second term basically gives you this and this, while the first term, they are like a two different way of contraction, but both of them gives you this contraction. And of course we need to remember that there is a minus sign. So actually, everything is proportional. I ju I'm just talking about relative uh, magnitude. Okay, so this is kind of interesting because what I was claiming is that, uh, okay, so there are several diagrams, but uh, the second and third diagram only gives you this structure, okay, which is basically the same as this in the next slide. But only the first diagram can give you this tensor structure and this tensor structure. So basically, this is telling us that the relative coefficient between this guy 
and this guy can, is already fixed to be like a 2 to minus 1. So this is basically telling us, so the combining observation 1 and 2, we can already uh, say something about uh, the matrix structure of gamma, which is the coefficient of log divergence. So now I'm considering some operator, trace phi i1, dot, 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 trace phi i l. And the claim is observation one basically tells us that uh, they, uh, they only interact, the, only the nearest neighbor interact with each other. So, and then observation two basically fixes the relative coefficient of some of the term. And so, so essentially, you see that the structure is given by something like this. OK, so this i is essentially uh, the field on i side. Okay, there are too many i's. Is this point clear? So because just by like discussing the tensor structure and also the fact that we are considering large in theory, we can already argue that gamma should have this structure. Yes, so I'm doing the identification like this because of the cyclicity of trace. So now, let me make another observation, which is observation three, which is SUSY. And let me just claim what SUSY tells us. That supersymmetry tells us that this operator, where Z is phi one plus I phi two, so one and two are the first and second index of SO6, is protected, which means that it doesn't receive any uh, quantum correction. So this means that this should be the zero eigenvector of gamma. And now I'm going to require that. If you require that, then it turns out you can determine this coefficient, basically this coefficient, to be two. Because uh, well, if you carefully uh, consider the action, uh, of this uh, gamma on this z to l, then you discover that essentially for z to l, this last term, so this last term doesn't contribute. So in order to have zero, you need to have a cancellation between the first term and second term, and that basically forces you to set this, uh, this term to be two. Okay. And finally, we need to decide, determine the overall factor. Actually, there is a no simple way to determine this overall factor without doing any computation. So I just claim that if you do the computation, this becomes this. Minus lambda over six, uh, 16 pi squared. And from now on, I'm going to denote it by minus g squared. It basically, my g squared is lambda over 16 pi squared. Okay. Now, so let me just summarize the final results. So gamma, okay, so I'm going to write it again. Uh, minus lambda over 16 pi squared times two times this minus uh, two times uh, this plus this, right? And as I said, the next ta task is to diagonalize this gamma. But before doing diagonalization, I should already say, I should already point out one thing. So this already looks like nearest neighbor spin chain, where each uh, side uh, have like a, SO6 vector spin. So each size can have index one to six. So you can kind of identify 
the operator that, that, that I was talking about with sorry, some spin chain state. And then in this interpretation, this gamma looks like Hamiltonian, nearest neighbor Hamiltonian of some spin chain state. So you can regard the problem of computing the two-point function as, com as the problem of computing or diagonalizing a sp some spin chain Hamiltonian. So this is how you get some 1 plus 1D system out of 3 plus 1D gate theory. But let's try to make the relation more manifest by considering the reduction to some well-known spin chain. So, so far, I was talking about the operators made up of uh, general six scalars, where each i runs from one to six. But now consider some subclass of operators made up of z, which is again phi one plus i phi two, and x, which is now phi three plus i phi four, some complex combination of the scalar field. And if you restrict yourself to this kind of operator, then it turns out this gamma restricted, restricted, now becomes something like this. So basically, the last term in the previous Hamiltonian drops out, and you get this. Furthermore, you can rewrite it into a nice form by regarding z as up spin and x as down spin. So then, if you do a little bit of algebra, then you can actually show this, like a pattern of weak contraction or like a index contraction is nothing but this. So now this is uh, spin half SU2 operator. And essentially what I mean by this dotted product is SI plus Z, SI plus one Z, plus SI X, SI plus one X, plus SI Y, SI plus one Y. So, well, you can think of it essentially like uh, Pauli matrices. So, now, I guess this gamma looks more familiar to you because now this is nothing but what people called uh, Hamiltonian of Heisenberg spin chain. If you neglect this uh, offset one over four. Okay? And so far, I was only telling you how one plus one dimensional system emerges from street plus one dimensional system. And so far, I was not talking about integrability. But the point is that this Heisenberg spin chain is actually integrable spin chain. What do I mean by integrable? Yes, the, what I mean by integrable is you can actually construct uh, infinitely many conserved charges But in addition to that, the, in the case of Heisenberg spin chain, there is a very nice uh, systematic way to uh, construct eigenstate. And compute eigenvalue of Hamiltonians.
So this systematic way is called Bete Ansatz. And now, the next goal of my lecture will be to talk about the Bete Ansatz. But since I have a little bit of more time, let me explain how to construct one eigenstate. So, so remember, Hamiltonian is given by this. Okay, so the claim, you can construct the ground state very easily. Essentially, the ground state is just all spin up. Of course, this is a well-known fact. This is a usual Heisenberg spin chain, and in particular, this is, if you look at the sign, this is ferromagnetic Heisenberg spin chain, and the ground state of ferromagnetic Heisenberg spin chain is just the, spin, uh, the, the configuration where all spins are up. Of course, you can also construct yet another eigenstate, which is all spin down. Okay, yeah, I still have nine more minutes, actually. <laughs> So, in, okay, let me just say that this is energy zero, if you just compute. Uh, there yes. Is a uh, uh. So here, spin up state is made of phi one and phi two. Yes. And spin down is made of phi three and phi four. So what, does the, what is the role of phi five and phi six? Yes, uh, good question. So, yeah, so let me, so, so the, okay, so, let me explain what the meaning of these equals zero ground state. So as you pointed out, this is essentially trace of Z to L. And this is trace of Z to X to L, right? And actually, they are both uh, BPS operators. So that's why they are protected, and they don't receive any quantum correction. Mm, then uh, there, are, uh, there are six colors in the and go for much right, right. So there are other two scholars. Yeah, so there are also other twos. And in a, actually, you can construct something like phi 5 plus i phi 6 to L. And this is also energy zero eigenstate. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going to talk about this operator now, because I already restricted my Hilbert space mm -hmm. to the space made up of, to the operators made up of z and x only. Oh, OK, thank you. But this is just a restriction for convenience. Uh, one question. Uh, so uh, when you uh, went for this, uh, like, uh, phi 1, phi 2, mm -hmm. phi 3, phi 4, 2, z and x, uh, so like you restricted the Hilbert space. Uh, so uh, instead of that, if I worked with this phi 1, phi 2, like the whole thing, mm -hmm. uh, so will there be still some connection with the spin chain? Uh, you are, sorry, uh, so what is the last question? Uh, like, uh, yeah. I'm uh, neglecting some interaction by doing that, right? Reflecting some inter Neglecting some interactions by... Uh, well, uh, okay, so, so, okay, so the question you're, probably you're asking is whether uh, the action of gamma is closed, okay, so the restriction to a subsector is uh, consistent yeah, yeah. with the gamma. And it is actually consistent. If you start with uh, operators made up of only x and z's, and then act gamma, then you still get the operators made up only x and z's. So we are taking a, into account all the terms in gamma, but it's just that you can't, like some of the terms in gamma just gives you zero if you restrict to this sector. So it's not approximation. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so let me construct another ground state because I, <laughs> I have one, one a little bit more time, so, so let's construct the first excited states. So I already constructed the ground state, so let me construct an, another state, which is the first excited state. Uh, essentially, so let's start from this guy, where all spins are up. So if you want to construct the excited state, uh, the natural guess is to flip one spin down. And let's introduce some notation. So I, introduce, I denote the state N, the state n means uh, the state where n's flim, spin is flipped. And let's use this notation 
and see how Hamiltonian acts on this n. And in order to see how Hamiltonian acts, it's actually better to uh, use the original description of uh, this index contraction. So this is essentially st telling us that uh, the action of Hamiltonian is like a uh, is either preserves the structure of the spin or flips the neighboring spin. So if you use this notation of the Hamiltonian and then act it on this state n, then you get something like two times n minus, okay, so I should put a proportional, proportionality sign, and n minus one minus n plus one. So this n minus one and n plus one is basically came from this uh, exchange term. So what, okay, so let me, briefly explain how this comes about. So you have originally this guy. And if you, so this is a sum over i's. And if you use this flip here, then you can move the spin to the left. And if you use the flip here, and then you can flip, you can uh, move the spin, down spin to the right. So these are two terms that I wrote here. And essentially, this 2 times n comes from this identity part. OK. And now, if you look at this right-hand side, you immediately notice that this is, in a sense, this is actually discretized Laplacian. Right? Which basically means that you can diagonalize this action of Hamiltonian by using the plane wave state. Okay, and then you can really kind of com compute the energy of this state. So th you can actually show that, confirm that this is actually the eigenstate, and the energy of this state becomes g squared times 1 minus cosine p. And if you expand this near p, uh, near p equals 0, then this is something like p squared. So you have some non-relativistic dispersion relation. OK. But there is actually one extra constraint we need to impose on p because we know that the spin chain is periodic, so we cannot put arbitrary p here. And the, the periodicity, if you impose the periodicity, then uh, basically you are identifying L plus 1 with 1. Because, so that, that basically means e to ip L plus 1 must be e to ip which is essentially saying that this momentum is quantized in the usual way. So now we got the answer. So the answer is that we first solve this equation. And once you solve this equation, you can plug in the value of p to this expression. And this gives the first excited state, which contains one downspin. So this is how you construct the eigenstate for one downspin. And tomorrow, I'm going to talk about how to construct the state with two downspins and how this can be generalized to like a more, ex more general excited states. And that's, based, that's the important content of the beta ansatz. OK, so is there any question about today's lecture? The equivalence with the spin chain uh, that is in the large and limit, right? Yes. Uh, so, like for fine, uh, I mean, if I uh, incorporate finite end correction, is there uh, still some Hamiltonian I will get uh, that will be mapped to this thing? Yes. So, if you start considering finite n, for example, uh, there is like a very, no, you can have very non local interaction because the, like a gluon exchange doesn't have to be nearest neighbor. And in addition, we started from a single trace operator, but at finite end, single trace operator can split because of non-planar weak contraction. So, 
So it, it's, I don't know how to formulate the problem because like uh, you start from one spin chain and it can split into two spin chain or three spin chain or four spin chain. It's more complicated problem and I don't know how to solve it. But you can, but it's true, you can still write down some Hamiltonian. In your ON vector model part, you, uh, you gave the quantum derivation of, of this young Baxter and things. And if you slightly generalize it to complex ones, the CPN models, I guess the derivation is just gone. Ah, uh, okay, 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 yeah. That's, you, you see, yeah. that's something I wanted to point out but forgot. But uh, let me just go back to, to okay, so, okay, so I should use this feature. So let me just go back. Yes, for us, it's a very interesting question. Uh, sorry. Uh, okay, let, let me try to find where I want it to go. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so, so you can actually do the analysis I did today for the CPN model. And the point is that even for CPN model, if you just consider classically, uh, then this equation is satisfied. But if you do the analysis, uh, the same analysis of listing all possible operators, then you do find some anomaly terms, which are not derivatives. And indeed, people found that the conservation laws are violated by performing one of an expansion in CPN model. If there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.